Hey, Elboists, have you checked out MKL Reads lately? MKL is the one-stop shop for handmade oboe reads where you can try reads from various makers and then select the one that is best for you. How cool is that? Visit mklreads.com and enter coupon code double space read space dish, all caps, for free shipping on your first order. This wouldn't be a double read podcast if we didn't talk about knives and knife sharpening. Since day one, Gender Read Knives have been the highest quality and the sharpest read knives on the market, and Gender Industries has been a driving force in educating double read players on how to sharpen and maintain their read knives since it is the single most important tool in our read making kit. Now, Genda has launched a full line of sharpening equipment to meet your sharpening needs. They are offering a wide variety of full size and travel size sharpening stones, strops, and compounds that can be utilized in the studio, the music hall, or on the go, and will make your sharpening better. You've got a great reed knife, and now it's time to start using good sharpening equipment. Add the code DRDGENDA, all caps, no spaces, at checkout and get 10% off any Genda Reed Knife Maintenance Kit, Reed Knife Sharpening Book, Cutting Block, and Reed Tool Roll. Visit them at www.gendaindustries.com. Oh, and they're more than just reed knives. Hi, I'm Galit Kaunitz. And I'm Jackie Wilson. And you're listening to Double Read Dish. A podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. It's episode 28. How are we doing? I'm having a hard time staying warm, to be honest. Oh, my God. I've gotten the thinnest skin since leaving Wisconsin. Now, when Missouri is like 20 degrees, I feel like I'm in the frozen tundra in the North <laughs> Pole, hanging out with Santa Claus. <laughs> Can I just complain about something for one second? Please do. I, I know I live in Mississippi, but it is so cold when it's 25 degrees and 99 percent humidity can i just complain about that this is not why we live in mississippi <laughs> yeah probably not we probably have listeners in much colder places going yeah yeah crimea river ladies <laughs> my problem is the humidity that's my problem when it's like 99 percent humidity it feels told it feels really cold it's so cold <laughs> yeah and i have the worst circulation it's just so how am I doing? Cold. I'm cold. <laughs> <laughs> and it's that weather, it's that time of year where, like, your reads change drastically <sighs> every single day. And Don't it's like, open uh, that Pandora's box right now. <laughs> legit, right? Like, there's always a little bit of change, but I feel <gasps> like I open up my read case, and one day it's one thing, and the next day, like, the read that played this way is the opposite in every single way and I'm just like I feel like I don't know you like we need a relationship <laughs> counselor you've changed what is happening Reed case like get it together please the only other time I remember feeling this full of rage is, <laughs> when, <laughs> is when I spent a couple of years cashiering before I got my first college teaching job that was the last time that I felt so, like, I opened the read box, and I'm filled with rage. <laughs> it's as bad as customer service. It's as bad as customer service. Shout out to all of the people out there who are weathering customer service jobs. And weathering ever-changing read cases. And ever-changing read cases. <laughs> We're all in this together. We can do it. Woo! We can do it. We're going to make it through. It will stabilize at some point, right? So what are we dishing about this week? Well, we are having a wistful dish today. What would you do if you weren't in music? So what would you do, Galit? Well, I always thought that I would do something like stable and useful, like being a nurse. But I think in actuality, I would probably go into something like creative writing <laughs> or something like that. That would be equally esoteric. <laughs> Well, I could see you being a great nurse 
because you have this disposition that makes people like feel yes, very at ease. Like, mm-hmm. thankfully, the listeners don't know this because it's all audio, but I have a very, like, it's been called resting brat face, we'll call it. <laughs> And people always say I look mean and angry. So I feel like I'd be the worst nurse. Like, I'd walk in to give the toddler the tetanus shot, and they'd, like, start screaming. And, like, I feel like you'd be really good at it, though. Oh, well, maybe I could do both. (laughs) Maybe I could be, like, a pediatric nurse by day. (laughs) And a murder mystery novelist by night. There you go. Perfect. That's it. It's decided. I'm quitting. <laughs> <laughs> what would you do? <laughs> well, see, I'm, like, as you know, very organized. And so I always thought if it wasn't music, it would be something that made use of my hyper-organization. Um, so I always thought I would love something where I could be both creative and then also hyper-controlling. <laughs> <laughs> So what, what, what ticked those boxes for you? <laughs> well, like a party planner or a uh-huh. wedding planner, you know, mm-hmm. where like someone just gives me gobs of money and I say, okay, we're going to do it my way and you're going to go away <laughs> and you're going to have your bachelorette party and you're going to have your baby shower or whatever. And then you're going to come back and I'm going to have done it all with your money. And then you're going to go ooh and ah about how great it is. And then I'm going to go home and plan the next party and it'll be phenomenal. <laughs> I did a thousand percent see that. You would be an amazing party planner. (laughs) I can attest because you planned my bachelorette party. I did. I did. I love planning parties. And my surprise birthday party. See? I... And the other thing I thought I could do, which I don't know how much I'd actually enjoy, but I know I would be phenomenal at it. You know how celebrities and, like, important people have personal assistants? And, like, they're too busy and important to run their own lives. And so they just have someone who's like, your appointment is here. You are going to the dentist at this time. And I packed your bag for this. And da-da-da-da-da. I would be the most amazing personal assistant, like, on the planet. I feel like I would be the most amazing celebrity. (laughs) (laughs) So you need to become, like, a famous actress, and I need to become your personal assistant, and then we can both, like, be living our best life. And you'll be great on, like, you know, Jay Leno's couch or whatever, and uh-huh. I'll be great at making sure you get there on time, dressed in peasant Listen, Listen, we'll split. All profits are split 50-50. We'll be like Oprah and Gail. <gasps> yes. Except I really feel like you're the Oprah and I'm the Gail, but we'll just have to pretend in public. I do shout positive affirmations quite well. (laughs) That's a great strength of mine. So we did a call for participation on our social media to see what you guys would do. Guys are so smart. I know. Like, I see all these people going into STEM, like saying, if I didn't do music, I'd do STEM. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, come do my homework 20 years ago, please. (laughs) Come do my homework, nerd. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, what were some of the common threads that we saw with our double read friends? For sure, science. Science is a big one. There's a lot of NASA. Yes, probably NASA. Tim Gawklin, uh, Nicole Fulmer, uh, who else said NASA? Um, Oh, Richard Cooper. They all said they'd be physicists at NASA, engineers, astronauts. Everyone Mm -hmm. wants to work at NASA. Pediatrician, my fellow pediatrician. You know what would be interesting? If we could survey NASA and see how many of the people currently working at NASA used to play double reads. I smell an article. That's a dissertation topic. Somebody <laughs> who's looking for a dissertation topic, it will <laughs> do that one. Mm-hmm. And then we also have some other interesting ideas like public speaking, something dealing with public speaking or a uh, therapist. Yes, Jenna Ingle says motivational speaker or itinerant preacher. I love it. Which I like. <laughs> Physical therapy or acupuncture from Thea Gross. Mm-hmm. Holistic healthcare, psychologist, writer. A lot of, like, things that merge science with creative, um, like, interpersonal 
field. Yes, Natalie says um, she would have liked to study a language, possibly Spanish or German, some sort of cultural studies, which makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. We have some diverse interests here. Also, Nicholas says he loves to cook and would be a chef. You are formally invited to come cook for us any time that you would like. Mm -hmm. I'm easier to cook for than Galit. That's true. I am a nightmare to cook for. (laughs) Um, Yeah. You know what? I'm actually interested in this idea of if I wasn't doing what I was, I would play double reads. I feel like Rain Wilson has a little bit of that in him. Oh, yeah. When he's not smashing bassoons. (laughs) <laughs> we've tumbled into some controversy <laughs> oh, but do you remember it was several years ago that Super Bowl commercial with the um, football player the football player who played the oboe yeah it's a member of the Woodwind family I loved that I was going to give another one from Twitter we got Katie Ashman says writing historical fiction being a freelance gardener and florist photographer artist uh, taekwondo and too many other alter egos. Oh my she can do flowers for my party planning. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you think was our best answer? Like, who wins the prize of, like, coolest job? Okay. So, Greg Stead would like to be an exotic dancer. Cool. Or a math teacher. Boo. Exotic math teacher, question mark? Exotic <laughs> math teacher. I think I would have got better grades. <laughs> Don't you hate feeling bored with all the music on your stand? Well, luckily, you never have to feel that way again. JDW Sheet Music offers a wide variety of chamber music pieces for wind players of all ages. Their catalog includes duets, trios, quintets, and even double reed choir pieces for beginner, intermediate, and advanced players. Each of the pieces on the site will include sample pages, audio excerpts, and short descriptions. JDW Sheet Music has also made it possible to access the music sooner through the new digital download-only feature. Pieces that are marked digital download only will be made available immediately after purchase. To learn more about JDW Sheet Music, please visit www.jdwsheetmusic.com. Today's episode is brought to you in part by Double or Nothing Reeds. You know them. They're the company that's dedicated to providing excellent handmade oboe and bassoon reeds to discriminating double reed players of all ages and abilities. And good news. Double or Nothing Reeds has recently expanded to sell double reed tools and supplies, gift items, and more. This includes knives, knife blades, thread, staples, cane, bags, and resources for students. Better yet, as authorized Fox and Yamaha dealers, they offer an extensive range of oboes and bassoons for all levels. Additionally, they sell quality used instruments on consignment. And if you're looking for private oboe lessons and can't find anyone nearby, Double or Nothing Reads offers oboe lessons via Skype. Visit their website, doubleornothingreads.com, for good quality and affordable read making supplies and resources, lessons, instruments, and much more. We are so excited to welcome to Double Read Dish, Bert Lucarelli, renowned oboe pedagogue and performer. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Could we start off by having you tell us how you came to play the oboe? Oh, yes. That's a fun story because I've told it several times and it's interesting. It fascinates people. Um, I originally, when I was a young kid, I was a baseball player and I, had, I was a pitcher. I loved pitching. And I re- continue to enjoy baseball. Um, but uh, I was in a terrible car accident, uh, in which my legs were nearly cut off. I was helping oh someone push a car to a gas station. And it was dusk, and uh, somebody didn't, didn't see us and totaled the car I was pushing. Mm. <clears throat> you know, standing in the middle. So... Uh, I was in the hospital for quite a while, and I was going into high school. I was 14 years old. I was just going into high school, and my father said to me, uh, you know, you're going to have to do something in high school. You know, you're not going to be able to pitch for a while. I said, what do you want me to do? And he said, why don't you play the oboe? And I said, and what's that? I had no idea, <laughs> no idea what it was. And he, uh, 
he explained to me that it was one of his favorite instruments and uh, and I should look into it. He, he didn't tell me any more than that. And so I went to school and I asked the band director what, what the, you know what a noble was. <laughs> and he, uh, he brought me one. And I still tell you, it's amazing to me, I still remember that moment. It was like one of those magical things. When I opened the case, I, I knew instantly that my life had changed. Um, it's just the, the, the whole the smell of it, you know, the, that rancid saliva. <laughs> <laughs> so I still remember all of it. The, 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 and, uh, and I just fell in love with it. And I, at first I played trumpet. And I think that that helped my oboe playing because... In a way, I mean, the way you use your air on a trumpet is very similar to an oboe. Um, and it was all very forward in the mouth because of buzzing the lips. And so that helped me initially get the air forward in my mouth. And um, and I had a pretty decent sound from the very, very beginning. And so, you know, we all like success. And so I liked playing the oboe. Because uh, I can tell you, I'm just not saying that myself, but... There was a clarinet teacher at the school who was very famous in Chicago education. And he wrote a book, and I had him autograph the book, and he signed it to Bert, the young man with a sound, and, <laughs> which was kind of nice. So from the very beginning, I, I had this kind of support about my sound. And I had very good teaching. The band director was one of these magical people. Also, I don't mean to overuse the word magic, but it's true. Uh, he was able to get players from Chicago Symphony to come and teach us for free. And uh, it, it helped enormously to have that level of teaching and playing around me. And I think that, that started me off in the right direction. His name was Robert Mayer. Some people may remember him. He was English horn player in Chicago Symphony for many, many years and uh, until he retired. And he... Uh, he, he was just one of, you know, I think almost every city has one of these um, teachers that inspires young people. I mean, in New York, the most famous when I first came to New York was Lois Wan at Juilliard. A lot of people, uh, a lot of professional musicians were started by her. And, uh, and I have students now who love teaching your young people. And, and they inspire them. It's great. I mean, I think it's a wonderful uh, way to use your education in music is by inspiring young people. So anyway, that's that's my beginning and this sort of what happened. Speaking of education and inspiring, can you tell us about um, your educational journey and how you got to where you are today? Sure. Um I, I was at Austin High School in Chicago, and, uh, and then we moved further west, and I went to Provisor Township for my last year, and I was a big shot, because you know, I played pretty well, and I took over. And then even at one point, um, the conductor of the uh, band got sick, and he asked me if I would just cover for him for about a month. And I did. <laughs> it was amazing. I, just, I did it. And, uh, and I was able to keep it going. You know, I was having, having a conversation this morning before we started talking with a friend of mine who lives in the neighborhood here. And he's a doctor. And he teaches as well. And he, we were talking about the idea of enthusiasm and how it's important to help students become enthusiastic about what they're doing. But that's maybe the most important thing. Mm-hmm. To, love, to love what you're doing. And um, that happened to me in high school, throughout high school. My closest friend at Austin High School was uh, Richard Cantor. He uh, uh, finally, he went to Curtis and then he became uh, second oboe in Chicago Symphony. Uh, Dick was uh, a year ahead of me and so he was like a mentor and he would come back every once in a while from school, from Curtis, and tell me everything that Tabitha had shown him and what they were doing and all that kind of stuff. So that was kind of exciting in a way. I loved it. But I never thought 
because <clears throat> he was a whiz player. I never thought that I could ever go to Curtis. I've never even tried. But I think I'm, I was foolish. You know, I was, I've always been a little bit oh, shy about what it is I can do. And you, you wouldn't know that given the career I've had. But <laughs> <it's> <laughs> fun, it is funny that I, I've always, uh, I, I, I never, as a young player, certainly put myself forward. And for instance, I didn't, I didn't audition. She was the other school that I thought was really been good. Oh, Juilliard, I didn't audition for Juilliard because I thought, well, I could never get in. And later I found out that the year that I would have auditioned for Juilliard, I could have walked in with a full scholarship because they had no over players in the school. It was, yeah. you know, they, they just didn't have any, you know, players audition. There are always a lot of reasons why uh, schools recruit and don't recruit. I, I was chairman of the wind department at the high school for many years, and um, it, I found out that it's it's almost cyclic, the concept of recruitment. And if you go out too much and try to get students to come, people think there's something wrong with you. So you have to, you have to yeah, that you're not drawing students just automatically. Uh, you know, so as a young teacher, I used to uh, be very hesitant about you know, going out and asking people to come and study with me. Um, nowadays, you know, I get these letters from schools saying, oh, we'll offer a full scholarship and you can play in our Woodring Quintet if you come. And, and I think, well, what's wrong? Why are, they, why are they not just getting students? So you have to be very careful about recruitment, I think, because you don't want to beg people to come and study with you. That's part of the game. So anyway, uh, I... Uh, auditioned for Northwestern, and I was accepted, but with no scholarship money, and I, I couldn't afford to go there. Uh, uh, my family did not have a lot of money, and so I auditioned also for Roosevelt, and they did accept me. And Ray Still had just come into Chicago, and I, I said to them, I'll come and study here, but I, I have to study with Ray Still. And so they, they hired Ray Still to, to teach me, which was really wonderful. And, and then also I have to say that I got into the civic orchestra. And uh, one of the things that civic had a three-hour uh, section rehearsal. And I was the only oboe player. So I had three hours with still as, as a section rehearsal privately. And then one hour civic gave us and, uh, as a private lesson. And then the school would give me. So I had five hours a week private lessons with Ray Still. Well, I mean... You have to be made of stone not to learn. <laughs> you know, he was really an extraordinary teacher, I must say. He, he had this ability of dissecting your problems. He loved if you came to him with problems in your playing because then he would analyze them. And I found out later that part of the reason for that was that he studied engineering before he studied oboe. Mm. And so he had that kind of mentality of analyzing things. And it was just great. And I used to jokingly say that they still took Humpty Dumpty apart and put him back together. <laughs> and, 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 this, and he solved all my problems. It was quite, quite not all, I don't know, but he, it was, it was wonderful. And then I went from still after Chicago. Uh, I got into civic opera in Chicago when I was 19. And I even subbed in Chicago Symphony for a while at that age. It was really extraordinary that I had that kind of luck. Um, and after a while, I got bored doing all that, and I, I moved to New York. And uh, in, so I only a actually have a, ma a bachelor's degree in oboe. Uh, and in New York, I, I got a lot of street smart. I got a lot of experience. I played with so many orchestras. I mean, there were some weeks when I had as many as three concerts at Carnegie Hall with different orchestras. So a lot of freelance work. And then I guess the most significant or well-known gig I had was with Stokowski in the American Symphony. And with that, I played English horn. And uh, it was, he was a great conductor to work with him. He, he taught so much. So I've had some extraordinary early experiences. And uh, at Lyric Opera, it was really great because we had... It was, the, it was what they call the golden age of opera. It was right, the post-World War II uh, period. 
And uh, we had some of the greatest conductors, like uh, uh, Tulio Serafin, who is a teacher of Maria Callas, and Tibaldi, and a lot of famous singers. Joan Sutherland studied with him. And he was just incredible to me, because he knew that I didn't know anything. <laughs> and, <laughs> and his response, instead of being hostile, was that during orchestra breaks, he would come and sit with me and take me through what was going to be coming during the next part of the rehearsal. And it was, so I had this coaching from one of the great, world's great conductors and teachers. He was, so I had my whole life had been full of those kind of lucky experiences, you know. And uh, I, I don't know, I don't know what brings that about. I think I'm, I don't like to say that because it means people who don't have those experiences are unlucky. I don't think there's something about it. I think uh, maybe it said I was just open always to things and I was very honest about who I, what I did know and what I didn't know and didn't try to con anybody. I don't think so. Anyway, think about that. I'm analyzing my, my words as I speak. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you know, I really, it was not a part of my head. I just, I, I couldn't. Be. You know, it's one of the things I say about playing the oboe that I love so much and music in general is I think the reason we do it is that we know when we've done something well, and we know when we've not done something well. Okay. And nobody can tell us. Nobody can tell us but that it was good when it wasn't, or vice versa, that it wasn't good when it was. And you know. Mm -hmm. And so it's one of the few things in your life, I think music, where you really know what's going on. And I don't think there are too many things in our life where we do know that. I mean, we have relationships with people, we talk to people, we have colleagues, and I don't know. Sometimes you don't know. I mean, I sometimes leave a room with a colleague with the feeling that I've been stabbed in the back. And, you know, it just... But I don't feel that about the oboe. I don't feel that about music. I mean, there's, a, mm. there's an honesty in my relationship with music that is really very profound, I think. One experience I'd love to ask you about is you commissioned and premiered the John Corigliano Oboe Concerto, and I'd love to hear about the process of that work coming about. Yes. Well, it's, you know, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, that, you know, I've worked so hard for so many things in my life, and they just don't come about. And I've gone to bed crying about things I didn't get. But on the other hand, things happened that just fell into my lap. And the Corigliano Concerto was one of those. I mean, uh, the New York, what happened was the New York State Arts Council had started a program of commissioning com uh, performers, giving performers commission money to commission a composer to write for them. And uh, I, I got a phone call from New York State Arts Council saying, you know, we understand that you're doing a lot of solo work and doing things like that, and you're out, out, out there, uh, and we have this program. Would you like, we'll give you $10,000 to go find a composer, an important composer, to write for you. Well, I, I mean, I didn't even I didn't even write a letter for that or ask for it. You know, so things like that happened in my life, and that's how the Corigliano Concerto came about. And I, it just so happened that uh, John was at the beginning of his, of his career as a composer, and uh, he had just written a few things that were that were received very well, and I knew him. We were good friends. And... Uh, I, in fact, I got him an apartment, apartment in my building. And um, <laughs> he, uh, I went to John and I said, John, how, would, you, would you do this? $10,000 is a lot of money in those days. It's 1973, I think. And uh, he said yes. And uh, he's a wonderful composer because he said, you know, I want to write a concerto that's an oboe concerto that could not be played on violin or trumpet or bassoon or any other instrument, clarinet. Sure. And <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, he actually studied oboe with me for six months before he started writing. And I showed him all kinds of stuff, like you know, uh, uh, circular breathing and then uh, things like that. And he, and then he sat down and wrote the concerto. And uh, it's for John. It's not easy. He he really is very careful about every note he puts on the page. And so uh, it took him a while to write the piece, and it was just, I think, a very special work. I mean, for instance, he targeted for the oboe. So what does the oboe do? Well, it tunes the orchestra. So the first movement, 
It's called a tuning game. And uh, if you know the piece, you'll know that it starts out with the oboe giving the A, and the audience doesn't really know when the concerto starts because it goes right directly from giving the A mm. into the piece beginning. And uh, in fact, when we performed it, I started the concerto with my back to the audience. I was tuning the orchestra. And by the time about 10 seconds went by, the, the piece had begun with my back to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, and it, there's, there are all kinds of... He has a good sense of humor, and you can hear it in the, the work. The second movement, he calls, I think... What do you call it? Song. Song. And he said, well, that's what the oboe does. It sings. And he tailored it to that. And the third woman, I suggested to him that since uh, multiphonics were beginning to come into fashion, that he might want to do a movement paying tribute to that concept. And so he scored that for multiphonics on the oboe with percussion. And so, and then the fourth movement is aria. And it's an aria dedicated to his father, who is a violinist concertmaster of the New York Philharmonic. And it's an upside-down aria where he said the oboe gets this big, fat sound in, in the lower register. So instead of coming to climax in the upper register, he turned it upside down. And when you listen to it, you'll hear that. that uh, and then there's a cadenza that is absolutely wild. It sounds like a violin cadenza. And um, the last movement is Reita. Re- which is a, a Moroccan instrument that's very much like an oboe, and he had just come back from Morocco, and so it's this wild dance. So it's a wonderful piece. I mean, I think and people have played it everywhere. It's been played in Europe. I have students who've played it in Europe, and uh, uh, other people who... In fact, I, somebody told me, I think someone else has recorded it. I, I've never heard it, but um, it's a terrific work, and... Since I played it, it was funny that one movement has these long, long lines in it that I, I had to take breaths during. I didn't do circular breathing at the time. I learned circular breathing after it. And since I played the piece, I've now used circular breathing in it. But, uh, I, you know, it's I, circular breathing is an interesting subject because I don't think it's necessary. I mean, the Strauss Concerto is helpful. But I think oh, circular breathing is helpful. But in the end, you have to, if you do circular breathing, you still have to phrase. And mm-hmm. that's a problem. It, scare, it, it sort of, it seduces you into not really phrasing because you don't have to take the breaths. And that's silly, of course, because even pianists need to breathe when they play and violinists and stuff like that. So anyway, that's the story about how the concerto came about and what it's, what it's about. Uh, I think it's one of the best work, new works for oboe. It's not new anymore. It was written in 19... I think I premiered it in 74. Uh, you're hearing an alarm going off in the house. Yeah. I have a question. Um, how did you... De- like, what was your decision-making process about um, going into solo work and recitaling rather than orchestral playing? What was that like? And I imagine it was a little bit scary when you first started out. I'd love to hear about that. Well, in a sense, it was not scary. It was sort of uh, important. I had to do it because I had I didn't start doing solo work until I was about 34. And I had done a lot of auditioning, and I won a couple of auditions. And for a variety of reasons, uh, I, I never took the jobs. And didn't, uh, in some cases, I didn't get them. But in a couple of very important jobs I got and was offered, and then... Things fell through, so it didn't happen. I didn't didn't go. But um, for instance, Houston, I was one I got, and I got Baltimore, and but and there was one other that didn't come through. So anyway, uh, and partially also, I never thought of myself as a really great aud- uh, auditioner until I started really to memorize all the excerpts. So I knew them so well, and I would you know like a typical punk, I would. As I was playing, I would move away from the music stand and just play from memory, and that always impressed. In the later auditions I took, it impressed conductors very much. Um, <laughs> that, that was my trick, actually, to, to win auditions. But <laughs> I, I, it's, you know, uh, what happened is I was doing so much freelance work in New York. I was very successful at, in freelancing, 
And um, there came a point when I just I, I just sort of got tired of playing in an orchestra. I mean, I just and I, I never forget. I was sitting in a rehearsal in uh, Carol Studios, which is a studio that a lot of freelance orchestras used to use, and uh, I. I started yawning, and really big time. And conductor even looked at me and said, "Bert, is something wrong?" And I thought, "Well, oh, I don't need to be here. This is not where I want to be." And uh, and I so I started doing a lot of chamber music, and then solo playing became part of that. And uh, and I started getting good reviews, and it just sort of it happened. And then the Coriano Concerto came about, and that did it even more. And so. It was almost like an accident. Again, it's like one of those lucky accidents that happens to you. Uh, I didn't really sit down and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a solo career. Uh, it just came about, really. And uh, I, then I got a manager who was giving me concerts. And there were times I would go out on tour with uh, chamber orchestras. I went, I, the, there was a small orchestra from England, England. I'm trying to remember now what it was called. But... Uh, I did a month of 18 concerts with them, and I did 16 concerts in Australia. And so that started to happen. And then, and then recording. I started doing recordings. And I was, uh, the funny thing is about it, I was always, I've always been entrepreneurial. I love the idea of making good things happen. And um, one, of my, one of my favorite things for people is I think of myself as a Cupid. I love bringing together good people. Hmm. And making good things happen. It's a kind of ho- almost a hobby of mine. And it, it kind of drizzled over into my own career that, I mean, I have said to students sometimes, you know, you, you have to make it happen. And what's difficult about that is you think that if you have to make it happen, it means you're not very good. People are not asking you to do it. But it's just the opposite, I think, you know, that, I mean, I said to students that, no one ever asked me to play the Mozart oboe quartet, but I've done, you know, well over a couple hundred performances of it, and it's because I made those things happen. And, you know, in in the music business, there has always been this kind of suspicion that if a, and a musician makes things happen, that they're not good enough, which is not really true. I mean, you know, in, if you look at any other performing uh, situation. I mean, just recently I watched a couple of days ago the Golden Globes, and if you think about it, most of those actors and actresses made that happen. I mean, Barbara Streisand would not appear in a movie that she's not producing. She is the producer, and she puts together the cast and the makeup director can hide her nose and uh, all kinds of. So when you're producing and you're making it happen, you're in much more control of the situation. And I think that I I would encourage young people to become more entrepreneurial and more, oh, I don't don't want to use the word aggressive because it has an overtone of being hostile, hostile, but you have to be be out there doing it, making it happen. I mean, I would not have even gotten the Coriano Concerto had I not been out there doing performances. And um, so... I mean, I think that's, ultimately, of course, people did ask me to do things. But uh, I think you have to be out there and engaged in the process, you know? Mm -hmm. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Another really significant part of your career is pedagogy. And I would be really interested in what significant things you learned or what advice you have for teaching effectively in the private lesson setting? First of all, I always like to say that I've had two of the most, well, actually three with Bob Mayer, but three of the most incredible teachers. I mean, absolutely wonderful teaching. Um, You know, as I I said about Ray Steele, the thing that uh, always impressed me about him and working with him was how he was able to love and dissect problems. And, um, then um, Bloom was a kind of magical teacher. I mean, he, he had a way of talking about music that was almost poetic. And so having those kind of influences, I felt as a, as a teacher, I had a responsibility to pass along what I had learned. 
because I, I mean I didn't fall out of the room being the oboist and musician that I am I was, I was taught and um, so I really believe it's possible to learn I mean another experience that taught me a lot about teaching is when I had that car accident I had to learn how to walk and, you know, walking is something we all consider very natural. You just get up out of a chair and you walk across the room. But, you know, it's a learned process. And um, I learned um, I learned how to walk. And I thought to myself, geez, if you can learn how to walk, you can learn how, and make it sound totally natural. You can learn how to play an instrument and make it sound totally natural. Because that's in the end what the goal is, I think. I mean, you don't want it to sound difficult. And you don't want to make walking look difficult. I mean, I've had to... You know what's amazing? I'm just recently in recovering from pneumonia, and I had to learn how to walk again because, you know, I was in bed for well, at least a month. Mm-hmm. Your, your muscles just atrophy, and you don't... And so I said to the physical therapist, you know, this is the first, fourth time in my life I'm learning how to walk. Because it's happened to me, you know, the first time with the accident, and then a couple of other times for a variety of reasons, and it's taught me so much about teaching and learning. And you know, uh, there, first of all, I think the most important thing, as I said earlier, I think enthusiasm is really critical. I mean, you have to love what you're doing, and uh, and if you can pass that sense of enthusiasm onto your students, it's. Uh, it's very special. And uh, I think, you know, Galit, I'm sorry, you know, everyone knows you're a student of mine. And, uh, <laughs> it's, 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 one, it's one of the things, and you'll have to admit, that I have fostered in you. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've helped you have a real sense of joy about playing and, and uh, having and to love it. Yeah, so, 100%. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a big part of it to me. And I know... There are all things have to do with the craft of oboe playing that I don't think we need to talk about in an interview like this, but um, you know that I learned from both Still and Bloom. I mean, Bloom I don't mean to diminish, but he taught me because he was poetic. I mean, he, there's so many wonderful things I learned from both of them. I mean, I jokingly say about Bloom, in fact, that um, <laughs> that the most important things I learned from him was through his elbow. <laughs> that we would play duets together, and I and he would lean on me, lean against me, and, and I could feel what he wanted with the interval. Hmm. You know, there's a there is a physical part of playing that is undeniable, and uh, you know I often say to the students, it's, the instrument is only half of the mechanism; the other is your body. And I've done a lot of work with Alexander technique and yoga, and. Uh, what else? Here's another discipline. I was into yoga. Oh, Pilates. And those things would teach you about how the body functions and how it, how it can help. I mean, you know, it's funny. We say uh, uh, Alexander's technique is so much about movement. You know, People think it's about posture. It's about movement and how the uh, body moves. Yeah, one of the things I say about... It's sort of fun. We use the word... This, I love words because they can transmit a particular physical response. And uh, so we say that music is moving. But that's exactly what it is. It's physical motion. It's the sound in motion. Mm-hmm. Uh, who, I think it was Casals. No, Toscanini said that music was sound in motion. I, I agree with that. It's very true. Uh, and, you know, I, we've talked about it in lessons that uh, some intervals have Sound has speed. It has a, a speed and direction. And I remember what great line of Bloom one time in a lesson he said to me, can you slow down that metronome from across the room without touching it? I mean, that's a really incredible concept, I think. Very powerful. Um, what did he mean by that? Well, he means that what he really ultimately meant for me, I thought if I had to uh, sim- simplify it and in terms of, he he when he said the metronome was your best friend, that you can't really play rubato without a metronome. The, the rubato is in relationship to the pulse. The metronome is the pulse, 
And so you can play slightly ahead of the metronome, slightly behind it. Sometimes you go right on it. And how you handle that connection and stuff is, is what really music is about. It's about the interval. And since the distance of an octave is much more than the distance of a third. So, and it's funny that we, we talk about speed as miles per hour. In other words, distance related to time. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's a big part. And I spent hours with Bloom working on phrasing, learning that concept of, of, of how, to, how to be slightly behind the metronome sometimes would make it much more powerful. If you played it too easily, if you, you were ahead of the metronome, it sounded like water coming out of the instrument instead of... Ta- they still used to call it taffy. You have to feel like you're pulling taffy when you're playing intervals. And uh, so all these words are really wonderful in a way, how they, how they inspire you to play differently. I mean, I had an experience about a week ago with a young, young boy who came for a lesson. And I think, what did I say to him? And it changed his sound just completely in the way he played the phrase. And I had a student who was a doctor once, and he said to me, he would love to know what actually happens in your body when a teacher says to you, for instance, oh, uh, let's play that sound as if you're blowing the air out of the top of your head. And it changes the way you sound. And he said he would love to know physically what that's hap- what's happening. And he, he would, wanted me to go talk to some neuroscientists about it. Um, it's so, and that's a, a wonderful way of, of crossing disciplines and, you know, ideas about what we do. Uh, when you think that, you know, maybe a neuroscientist can tell you something about how to play oboe. Uh, fascinating. You know, I think, for instance, that uh, when you're phrasing, you should think of vowel sounds. You know, music is really, I mean, for instance, Brahms, violin concerto, you think, I'm using e a o a e a o e a and so I, I love it was shown to me by a wonderful French horn player actually I didn't invent that uh, and it, it, it works so well with students to let them use what are known as the Italian vocals the Italian vocals are a e i o u <laughs> and all real sound is built on using those I mean you can't you can't sing a diphthong mm-hmm and you, you know, uh, uh, umlaut, for instance, German umlaut, U with two dots over E, is really E and U put together. And it doesn't, you can't project with that. It, you, need, you need to modify it. And singers study, I mean, I studied voice for a while. Singers spend a lot of time thinking about how they're going to modify the vowel in the language, which is why sometimes it's not all that understandable to the audience, you know. I mean, I speak fluent Italian it was my first language and I go and I hear Italian operas and I have no idea sometimes what they're saying <laughs> which I think is a fallacy in this whole sort of business of I'm, I'm not sure I agree with the idea that you have these words for the audience that are translations I don't know that that's such a great idea because it distracts you from listening mm. so I mean why would you want to pay $300 to sit in a seat at the Metropolitan Opera and read uh, the libretto and not listen to what's happening. You know, <laughs> it seems mm-hmm. pretty odd to me. I, I, I don't know. I just, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not convinced of either. Yet, of course, it is. It's important to know what the words are. But I mean, sometimes the most important things in our life are unsaid, unspoken. You know. Or, or that's another thing about everybody wants to play loud and be projecting and I'm thinking well gee the most important things in our lives we say are very soft hmm. like you know I love you you know you, you don't say I love you <laughs> <laughs> <What's your dad? laughs> you know it's, it's it's fun to try to think about these things and to, then Never lose your sense of humor because we're all frail and we're all vulnerable. 
And uh, if you don't have a sense of humor about it, it's it's going to cause disaster. You know, <laughs> become so uh, I don't know analytical in a wrong way, in a way that destroys you. So anyway, that's I don't want to get too philosophical here, but that's <laughs> what I think about teaching. Um, I mean, you know, I mean, what one of the things that is really very profound for me in teaching is that I think I've been, I, I know that I've, I've had some students who have come to me years later and say, you and maybe don't realize it, but you saved my life. I was about to commit suicide when I met you. And I just, I'm, it brings tears to my eyes to think that, you know, that you can have that kind of an effect on somebody. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, you know, I, I can, tell you several names but I it's not necessary but yeah, and so the act of teaching is so profound I think don't you think I started yeah. using that word <laughs> <laughs> I mean it's I do think that about music and about about what I what I've had the good luck I've had in spending my life the way I have and uh, been able to pay my rent I mean I've I, People think I've gotten rich from some things like, uh, I still love it, it's such a joke. The sensual sound of these soulful oboe is one of the crossover records I did. Uh-huh. The story of that is another accident. I mean, it, and it's one of the biggest selling oboe records in history. I mean, it sold over 60,000, which is really big for an oboe. <laughs> uh, I mean, most oboe recordings uh, are happy if they sell somewhere between two and 5,000. What happened is I went to see this producer because I knew his secretary. She was a friend of mine. And she said, Why don't you, you know, he, he uh, has several record companies and maybe you should talk with him about what you'd like to do. And so I went and I talked with him. And I wanted to, you know, I presented the idea of recording the Mozart Oboe Quartet and, you know, pieces like that. And he said, well, let me think about it. And he called me back a couple of days later. He said, I have an idea. I want to do an oboe record that is... Tunes that everybody knows, but classical tunes that are arranged in a more kind of accessible way. And so he he went out and he found these melodies, and uh, and got an arranger who did a lot of pop stuff, and uh, we recorded it. I, he never told me what he was going to call the record, so we just recorded it. And I did. I thought, oh, the only thing, oh, the only thing that matters is I play well. I mean, it's just kind of. I thought, it's music everybody knows, it's sort of ordinary, but yeah, that's okay. So, and the, the arrangements were very pretty, and we did it. When we finished, he told me, he was putting the album together, and he told me he was going to sol- call it the sensual sound of the soulful oboe. Well, I just panicked, I freaked out, <laughs> oh my God, I, mean, so I can't be associated with that. And so I said to him, you know, uh, it's all right, you can take it, do it, but you know, I would rather you not use my name. And he said, it's all right, it's all right. You know, we'll make up a name of a noble player. We'll call him, you know, some Italian name and give, we'll write a biography, a fake biography. He was not, he was undeterred by my reticence. <laughs> <laughs> and about two days before I was talking to a friend of mine who was very important in the music business, I, I he was born nameless. I don't like to name drop, but he, he said, are you kidding? He said, get your name on that album. He said, that's going to sell... Thousands. So I thought, okay, so I called Joe. His name was Joe Aben, the producer. I called Joe and I said, Joe, I think I've changed my mind. I'm going to put my name on. He said, fine. He said, I'm glad you called me today because we're going to go to press tomorrow. And I said, <laughs> it's very easy for me to just change your name on the album. And it sold something. And a lot of people have been jealous of what I did. They think, you know, oh my God, how did Bert get that? And what are you doing? And they think I became rich. But the point is, I didn't get rich because it was the first album of that sort I did. And uh, I think I I got like less than two cents an album, <laughs> and it wow yeah. But it, it certainly it it became. I think it was a nice album. I mean, I've gotten letters from oncologists in fact who use it when they're treating patients with chemotherapy, and they tell me how it soothes their patients, and makes them feel good. I mean, I got one letter from a Russian family that defected to the United States, and he told me that the only album. The only CD they took with them 
was the central sound of the Sokol Oba. I mean, it's got to be a humbling thought, don't you think? I mean, you think of all the possible things. That, I just, man, I, I kind of was amazed. I was very humbled by that. Um, so I've had this wonderful career outside of an orchestra, and uh, I've been very lucky. I mean, you know, in Europe especially, it's funny, I was called, who is it? Uh, what's his name in the Berlin Philharmonic? The uh, associate oboist. Do you remember? Do you remember his name? Wonderful guy. Um, he, not Jonathan Kelly. Yes, Jonathan Kelly. Jonathan Kelly. Kelly, okay. Yeah, he's a sweetheart. And uh, I went to a master class that he was doing, and um, he saw me in the audience, and he, he came down and shook my hand, and he said to everyone, I don't know if you know who this is. This is a legend in Europe. Yeah, I mean, Jesus. <laughs> It's got to be very humbling to have someone say that. Mm-hmm. Don't you think? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and especially someone like Jonathan, who I have so much respect for. So I've had all these incredible things happen in my life, and I encourage all of you to just do it. You know, follow your instinct, follow your dreams. Uh, don't be afraid. I wasn't afraid when I started doing solo work. I was too dumb. I just... <laughs> <laughs> I just did it. I did it because I had to. You know, I, uh, for me, there was almost no alternative. I mean, was, I couldn't sit there and yawn through rehearsals. Mm-hmm. I, that, I, I knew that when that happened to me, I thought, I'm not going to spend my life doing this. This is not going to be the way. So, what can I tell you? That's, that's how it's happened. I'd be, I almost feel like a victim of my career. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And in a sense, because I didn't play in an orchestra, I've said to students, I sometimes feel that I, I, I became a soloist because I'm a failure. <laughs> Think of that. Because I, I didn't play in an orca, major orchestra. Wow. It's a, a funny upside-down kind of thing that happens. I think you should just go ahead and play, and play as beautifully as you can, and get as many people to listen to you. And if, you, if they can pay you, and you can pay your rent, it's about as good as you can get. I, I don't know, you know, but I can say. Anything uh, else? I think I've told the whole thing. I've spilled the beans. <laughs> I, I, but I haven't talked about the book that I did. Uh, there's another lucky thing. I had been asked because I talked to friends who are in the publishing business, and they said, oh, gosh, you've had su- such an interesting life. Why don't you write an autobiography? And I started writing an autobiography, and about, after about chapter three or four, I thought, oh, God. This is so boring. I mean, I need to do it again. And so I just stopped, and I had a student who was a pianist. He was uh, actually piano. He accompanied my studio class. And after a, a couple of classes, he came to me, and he said, I wonder if you would mind giving me some lessons, because I'm having trouble. I said, I, it's not the piano. I'm having trouble communicating with an audience. And so, of course, I, you know, if anybody thinks I can help them, I wouldn't say no. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll try some of you, you know, don't ask me to tell you how to finger stuff on the piano and things like that. And we worked, and during one of the lessons, he said to me, you know, we talked about the book and what was going on, and he said, why don't you let me interview you? His name is Daniel Pereira, magnificent pianist, and um, he's in Spain now. And uh, so I, I said, well, let's try it. And we, funny, oddly enough, we did it on Skype. We did something like 24 hours of interviews on Skype. And, and we sent it to a court stenographer, and she. then we edited. We took all the uhs and gosh, all those things out of it. And, uh, and, and we, we had, had it print, you know, type written, and I was sending it around to publishers. And one day, here's again an accident. I'm sitting having breakfast at a little diner on the west side with an old friend of mine who was an editor at International Music, and he was now working Carl Fisher. And I happened to have the manuscript with me because I had to get copies of it. I was sending it to publishers. It never occurred to me that Carl Fisher would do it because they don't publish uh, books. They are the biggest publisher of piano music. And so uh, he said, what's that? And I told him the whole story. He said, can I read it? I said, sure. 
And so I made it, you know, we're going to make copies. I make an extra copy for you. Three days later, he calls me back. He says, everyone in the office has read it, and they're in love, and they think we have to publish it. I mean, what are the chances that that happened? Mm-hmm. It's so bizarre. Uh, and so the book got published. And it's all about what we've been talking about. And I think, it, uh, I think I, I, what I meant for it to be was exactly what we're doing today. And sort of, I hope that my career has been inspiration for other young players to know that if they don't get an orchestra job, it doesn't mean that their life is over. That, you know, uh, I think that playing in a or major orchestra is a wonderful thing. I love the sound of sitting, the feeling you're sitting in the middle of the sound when you're doing a Mahler symphony. And you're saying, Holy cow. But still, if you don't do that, it's not the end of the world. I mean, you have other things you can do, and they're much more, in some way, uh, forgive me, but they're much more interesting because they're self-created, they're self-motivated. And um, so I would, uh, I hope that that book lets young people realize that there's life after the orchestra. You don't, you, if you don't win an audition, you don't have to go sell groceries in a supermarket. You can, uh, uh, you can make music happen and you can change people's lives and you can be very, very involved and proud of what you do, you know? So, Absolutely. I, you know, that's it. And the book, can you tell us what the book is called? Yeah, the book is, <laughs> is a funny title. It's, uh, We Can't Always Play Waltzes. And uh, that title comes from a funny experience I had. I was playing a principal oboe in a Grand Park Orchestra, and the flute player, principal flutist, was Joan Bennett, who played with Chicago Symphony. And she came in at one row and she said to me, oh, God, i got to tell you what happened to me, just the most bizarre thing. I said, what? So she said, I'm coming down my building. She was living in a high-rise in Chicago. And she said, I'm coming down my building with the flute under my arm. And this little Viennese lady says to me, oh, sir, you're the flute player. And so without imitating Viennese accent too much, she, she said, uh, yes. And then she said, I got embarrassed because I thought she's been listening to me. And, I'm, and when I practice, it's not very nice to listen to it. And I said to her, I hope you don't mind, but I do a lot of scales and etudes. And the woman said, you know, we can't always play waltzes. Mm. And I thought, gosh, if I ever do a book, that's got to be the title because it says it says so much about our that's lives. Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the story of the book. And uh, I hope, you know, people will uh, enjoy it and learn something from it if they read it. Well, yeah. Yeah. I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It has been so wonderful to talk to you oh, okay. and to bring your thoughts to our listeners. We can't thank you enough. You know, uh, I uh, thank you, and I also you know, wish all of you to have this, have good luck and be involved. Enjoy it. Enjoy the process. You know, it's so much it's so much fun to have a career in music, uh, and there are disappointments. You know, as I said, so. Just enjoy the whole process. That's the most important thing. Okay? Absolutely. Thank you so much. Good luck. Thank you. As usual, you can find us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can always email us at doubleredish at gmail.com. And you can listen on all of the platforms in uh, wherever you listen to podcasts, as well as YouTube. And do not forget to tune in for our next episode. We have special guest Gustavo Nunez, principal bassoon of the Royal Concertgebouw Orchestra. And yes, I know I'm pronouncing that correctly because he taught me how to pronounce it. <laughs>